Okay, perhaps we can slowly but surely begin to make a start just because we're limited for time. And as you can see, there's quite a few of us here this morning. So we want to make sure you have a chance to hear from everybody. My name is Dr. Hannah Bagawi. I am uh, the co-head of the economics department here at SOAS. Um, and I'm gonna go around and let everyone introduce themselves and then we'll give you a sense of uh, how we're gonna run today. So I'll hand over to Fabio first. And perhaps once you've done your intro, you can call on someone else, Fabio, to say hello. All right. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Fabio Gigi. I'm representing anthropology today. I'm a medical anthropologist by training and my regional specialization is uh, Japan. Um, I'll call up, I'll call on Mira. Hello, I'm uh, Dr. Mira Sabaratnam from the Department of Politics and International Studies. I'm a specialist in international relations and I've worked on uh, state building, international aid and development, and also um, the colonial and post-colonial questions that arise from the study of politics. Nice to meet you. I'll go to Lucia. Hello everyone, I'm Lucia Kula. I am a lecturer in law and gender. Um, my research focuses predominantly in sub-Saharan Africa with a focus on um, Portuguese and French-speaking Africa, predominantly Angola and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, glad to be here today. Looking forward to your questions. All on uh, Amani, sorry. <laughs> that's fine, we'll go straight to Michael, if that's all right. Hi, I'm Mike Jennings. I'm based in the Department for Development Studies. Uh, I work on a range of issues around NGOs and aid, religion and development and global health. Uh, welcome everyone. I hope you enjoyed uh, this morning's chat and I'm gonna call on Unsuk. Hello, thank you, Michael. Uh, my name is Unsuk. I'm representing Scrub Finance and Management. Uh, so today uh, I would like to help you any question for BSc Management and BSc Accounting and Finance degree. And I will pass to the Teresa, yeah. Hi, I'm Teresa. I um, have a PhD in economics. I've been working here at SOAS for a year and a half now. And I teach um, econometrics, which is applied statistics for economics. I don't know who is still left. That's everyone, thanks, Teresa. So Teresa's representing the economics department because I'm actually here in the capacity to chair this particular session. So the first thing we thought we would do is um, pose some questions to the panelists. And the first question we thought um, you as prospective students might be interested in is to hear what are the urgent questions or challenges in the particular subject areas um, the panelists uh, teach on and research on. So perhaps we'll um, go with Mike Jennings first, if that's all right, Mike. Thanks, Hannah. I mean, there's an extent to which I think development studies engages with all of the key global issues uh, that are of priority at the moment, issues around obviously poverty, social injustice and inequality, migration, violence, conflict, and so on, uh, climate change and global health, global health. But I think one of the big questions that we as a, as a discipline are trying to address is trying to understand better the impact of policies and programs and efforts to address those. There's a huge emphasis at the moment on big data, on big interventions, on a macro perspective. And what we're looking at is, well, what actually happens? Are the things that are being put in place to address all of these issues actually achieving the ends they want? And what is the experience of people living in conflict or in poverty or vulnerability and marginal and how can we understand their needs better to be able to feed into better social global change? Thanks. Thanks, Michael. So it might be interesting to hear a, a very uh, kind of different discipline and hear from law in terms of how that might contrast. Um, so Lucia, over to you. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, really interesting challenges for law because we're looking at particularly at human rights law, the challenges around, let's say, the global pandemic the issues on borders, and but also the legitima legitimization of institutions, right? So we're looking at how it can be, um, how we need to rec reconceptualize international law, human rights law, to be able to look forward to an era where we actually addressing issues without the limitations that we currently have with current instrument, uh, legal instruments that are not necessarily able to address issues such as global, um, um, global challenges in a pandemic, but also issues on the environment. So social and political justice becomes a very important uh, question when it comes to law, but also when it comes to gender issues. So how does it affect 
women, how does it affect other marginalized groups? And these are the challenges predominantly lawyers and um, particularly human rights lawyers are dealing with in the field of law. But it means, of course, also reconceptualizing our understanding of what law actually is, looking at decolonizing the ideas around knowledge productions of law and how we engage with law when we're looking at marginalized communities or regions in when it comes to actual um, teachings of law and knowledge production in the academic setting as well. Lovely, thanks Lucia. Let's go over to politics. Mira, over to you. Hello, well, what isn't urgent in the world of politics at the moment, I suppose is the easier question to answer. Um, I suppose we're living in a kind of unprecedented time in the political world, particularly from the last, uh, I would say 10 years or so. Um, the levels of dissatisfaction with government, both uh, national and global have greatly expanded. Ideologies, which we thought we'd said goodbye to in the 20th century appear to be back in enormous um, uh, and surprising levels of popularity. We have got a order in which technology is radically reshaping our ideas of what it means to be a citizen, who we relate to, what our values are. We've got an unprecedented concentration of wealth in the hands of corporations, uh, global actors of different kinds. And we have an extraordinary level of violence, both direct violence and what we might think of as indirect or structural violence, um, the kinds of deaths that are allowed to happen as a result of political neglect. So all of these things are very much live questions uh, in the political world. Um, and so it's a great time to think about politics and to study it, but also to try and redesign and reorganize um, our ideas of what we're actually looking at. What does democracy mean under these conditions? What does citizenship mean? What does international order mean when so many things are in tumult? Thanks, Mira. And just because you mentioned inequalities, and I know that's something that's key to the issues that we're interested in economics, I'm going to hand over to Teresa to perhaps build on that. Hi, thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah, so in economics, I would say, obviously, like all the other subjects, there are many pressing issues, but I think three are quite important at the moment. I would say, as Hannah uh, mentioned, inequality. Um, inequality, especially after COVID, has increased quite a lot. Uh, in the UK, for example, the top 10% uh, got 50,000 richer uh, after uh, COVID. In Brazil, for example, as well, 1% of the richest people in the country now own 50% of the entire wealth. So I think this is something that in economics, we need to think of how we can address not only from an economics perspective, but how we can also cause and have consequences in other, in other subjects like politics as well. And uh, the other two that I believe that are also pressing uh, in economics is the fact that how the pandemic is going to change some of the economic theories and some of the economic policies that uh, we, we have learned and that uh, we have followed uh, lately, for instance, in the UK, but not only in the UK, we see inflation rising, we also see a rise of unemployment or precarious employment. So I think this is also something that is quite important in economics and how we can address those issues. And finally, um, climate change. So we know this is also a very uh, urgent matter and we want to know uh, how climate change can uh, affect policy making from an economics perspective. Should we still follow growth? Uh, should this growth be a green growth? Should we actually stop trying to increase our GDP? So these are also some of the topics that uh, we also cover in the economics department. Thanks, Teresa. Um, let's perhaps hand over to anthropology with Fabio, please. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Well, yes, anthropologists engage with all of these questions, uh, maybe in a slightly different way, because as anthropologists, what we try to do, we try to immerse ourselves in local life worlds and then try to understand how these larger changes influence them. So the challenge for the discipline really is very much to keep one eye trained on the global movement, on questions of social justice, on questions of climate change, um, on questions of uh, inequality, um, with one eye and on the other to sort of understand how these sort of global um, uh, shifts um, have a direct influence on how people experience their own life world. Uh, and as a medical anthropologist in particular, for example, the question of uh, vaccination hesitancy is something that is really very interesting to think of 
in terms of the links of politics and culture. Um, and it's something that you really can only get to if you immerse yourself in a particular local world and see these different connections. Um, so this double vision, in essence, um, is what is really uh, very challenging. And as Lucia also had said, the questions of knowledge production uh, are very important, the epistemology. What does uh, decolonization mean uh, for, the dip, uh, for the discipline of anthropology, which of course, as you all know, has emerged out of very much out of a colonial situation. Thanks, Thank Abby, you. lots of food for thought. Um, so last but certainly not least, let's hear from finance and management and Unsuk. Actually, I'd like to say I'm very lucky to be the last representative to say because Okay, study management is, I would like to echo all like our representative there, what they mentioned, the challenges in their department, their study. So study management is about uh, private and then public sector organization in their economic and political, politics, social and cultural environment, which means the key word in management study at the moment is about the speed. Okay, speed about the change in the technology, speed of the change in political environment, social environment, and the key principles. And then we, our more focal point is, okay, to what extent the speed of the change in economic, social, and culture or low their environment in terms of our functional level of doing business, for example, what is the implication for the marketing? What is the implication for the human resource management? What is the implication for strategy? financing, accounting. Also, if further we extend it to not just simply conventional profit maximization, maximize organization, we more talking about social influence, social contribution, environmental contribution of the management and the farm. So, so it's very dynamic array of the study, not just within the farm, in terms of the coverage is uh, moving to the society, to the environment, and then we need to consider the big change in technology. So we try to teach students for the key principle as well as analytical tool, techniques, and financial theory and accounting theory as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Unsuk. So that leads us on nicely to what we thought you uh, would all be interested in as prospective students to our second question, which is really about why SOAS and why would you want to do this discipline at SOAS compared to perhaps another uh, UK or other higher education institution. So we're going to turn to the panelists and ask them what makes their discipline uh, partic particularly different or unique um, and what would your experience perhaps be at SOAS that's different uh, for their particular subject. So, sorry, I feel like I'm, I'm putting you all on the spot because you never know what name I'm going to shout out. But OK, let's start with Mira this time, if that's OK for politics. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Um, so political science has normally taken an approach which has used Western democracies as the model for understanding normal politics and then looked at the rest of the world, if it's interested in the rest of the world at all, uh, through that lens. Now, what we do in the SOAS politics department in our politics, our international relations and also our PPE program is we kind of flip that. So we understand what the kind of classic texts have said, but then we also say, does this actually apply both in the West, but mostly in the world outside the West, right? Does politics in Africa look like this? Does politics in Asia look like this? What about politics in the Middle East? And actually we look at the theories and ideas and experiences that have come out from those regions that may actually have something very interesting to say about the rest of the world. The give you an example um a lot of people in the West, I suppose, were quite surprised by the experiences of austerity after the financial crash, um, of financial crisis of uh, 2008. And um, but what we've been going through is actually what a lot of African economies and polities have been going through since the 19 kind of 70s and particularly the 1980s. And so a lot of the impact on the population and on how democracy worked and how the finances were structured, we can actually see later happening in the West. So being able to reverse that gaze, be less what we call Eurocentric in our approach to thinking about politics is absolutely critical. And I would also say that we have a very high concentration of scholars with experience and expertise in looking at what I would call the post-colonial uh, dimensions of politics. So that is how it affects our theories, how it affects our values, and where we can see these kind of contemporary practices today um, around the world. So that's, I would say, um, key things. 
Thank you, Mira. Um, and in fact, Unsuk, I'm going to come back to you because you were sort of touching upon ways in which things are different within finance and management. So I'll let you carry on and expand a bit on that. Okay, so I would like to echo the Mira's point. Yes, yeah, so we are SOAS in overall, as you know, uh, we are highly globalized. Also, we are emphasized on something very niche. It's not touched by so-called mainstream, but we put that value on it. At the same time, we don't ignore like the key mainstream as well. So it means SOAS uh, in our department, we'd like to say our department basically cover all key theory and principle and then key discipline or management what provide by all other UK university in the world. However, what makes SOAS in school, school of finance and management differentiated from others is we are very globalized in terms of our curriculum, our teaching staff. So for example, in our undergraduate program, students are given the opportunity to choose various language options, including Korean, Japanese, Chinese, Arab language as a part of your elective module. Also, uh, I would like to say SOAS is one of the only university, as I know, based on my knowledge in Europe or even in the world, we provide the taste of the regional focus management and business. So part of your uh, curriculum degree, our department provide, for example, okay, finance in Japan, management in Japan, finance in China, finance in Middle East and in North Africa, uh, management in China, management in Japan, management in, in North America, I'm sorry, uh, North Africa and the Middle East. So you can have a sort of the opportunity to apply your knowledge in a key discipline or management into the different kinds of the region, which provide different political, cultural, customer, social, uh, social environment. So I would like to say this is one of the major key strengths in our department. Yep. Thank you. Oh, sorry, can I just add one more? Our BSc finance and accounting and finance uh, degree, upon your graduation, you are going to get a, a uh, six exemption from the ACCA and the six exemption for the CIMA. Both are the key chartered association of accounting association. So you can have an easy transfer to as a qualified accountant after, upon your graduation from our BSc finance uh, accounting and finance degree. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Unsuk. Um, I should say just briefly, if you have got questions, if they're particular um, panelists or there's something pressing, perhaps for now what you could do is put them into the chat and we'll come back to them at the end. And there'll also be a chance for you to raise your hand and ask a question if you prefer to do it that way at the end. Um, let's, after Unsuk's intervention, uh, perhaps go to Teresa to just hear from economics and hear how that might differ from the finance and management side a little bit too. So Teresa, over to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I, I would agree with my colleagues that in economics, we also see, for example, uh, different theories and that what we would see in other universities. So, for example, if we want to explain um, the effects of COVID, for instance, we are not going to look only at those uh, theories that we would see, for example, in The Economist or in the Financial Times. We also see all other uh, views on, from it. So from a Keynesian perspective, from a Marxist perspective, and also from economic theories from developing countries. So um, I'm from Brazil, I'm from Latin America. We also learn some of those, those theories from what we call the structuralists. So I would say this is one key difference from our department at SOAS, from other uh, departments economics in the UK. I would also uh, say that our department does look uh, have a, has a global outlook on how policies, for instance, in the UK and in Europe, also have an effect in developing countries. So for example, if the central bank uh, raises interest rates here in the UK, what is going to happen, for example, with Nigeria? So I would say that this is also something that uh, makes us a bit different instead of just focusing uh, very strictly on where we are. Uh, we also have this global outlook. We also have, as I would say, maybe in finance, we do in our department have uh, the, we give you the tools to do this analysis yourselves. And this is, I think, very important because for the job market, uh, it's always great to have uh, some programming skills, 
know how to do how to handle Excel, for example. And over our modules, we do cover uh, statistical programs and we do those analysis with real world data to see how if actually the data corresponds to the economic theories as well. And finally, I think that one of the key differences is that you can also join uh, the Department of Economics, even if you don't have an A levels uh, in maths, but still get um, but, uh, BSc uh, in, in core economics. So this is the difference uh, of our department. You need to take some further maths and statistics, but it would be possible for, me, for you to actually have uh, the Bachelor of Science. Thanks. Thank you, Teresa. Um, Let's hand over to Mike Jennings for development studies. Thanks, Anna. Just to quickly follow up on something that Unsuk said, that there is no institution like SOAS in the world at all for anything. So whatever subject you're coming to study, you're going to have a, a uniquely SOAS experience. Um, uh, and, and we're a small institution, so whatever subject you're studying, you'll also probably be taking modules uh, from other departments as well. In terms of our department, I think there are two main things that mark us out or mark our program out as different from the way you'd study global development in other institutions. The first is context. Look, SOAS as an institution was founded upon the idea that context and place really matter. And that it's vital to understand that. And we in the department, as with everyone here and all the other departments uh, across SOAS, have that at the heart of their curriculum, have that at the heart of all their teaching as well as their research. So that marks out what we do. We don't just teach about the general issues, migration, NGOs, aid, conflict. We think about how it differs, what difference place makes, not just a geographical place, but also specific communities groups within those communities. So all the staff have not just a, a research focus and a teaching focus on the thematic issues, but we also apply that in our research and our teaching to the countries and regions across Africa, uh, Middle East, uh, Asia, and also Latin America. We also have several staff who work on that. The second thing is that we're one of the few um, to, uh, one of the few undergraduate programs that is based in a specific development studies department, rather than being a program in, let's say, a politics department or an economics department, geography, anthropology. And what that means is that we're bringing to, so development studies is by definition almost is a multidisciplinary or an interdisciplinary degree program. So in our department, we have people who are anthropologists. We have people from politics and international relations. We have engineers. I'm a historian by background. So our programs not only look at specific regional contexts and differences, but they apply different disciplinary focus, uh, foci to them to ask looking at the same problem but through different lenses and asking different questions of it to really understand it and so I think both of those things combined with the distinctiveness that is so as itself make our program very different from the kinds of programs that would be offered in other institutions. Fab, thank you Mike um, let's hand over to Law and Lucia and we'll let Fabio go last if that's okay Fabio. Thank you. And I think my colleagues, most of them have already raised why SOAS is so unique for you to study uh, at SOAS. And in law, it's not that much different. We do give you the, the let's say, the standard law degree that you would get at a, any other university in the UK. But the added bonuses that you get to look at different parts of the world are not necessar necessarily included in other programs. We have modules that look particularly at, let's say, the legal systems of Asia and Africa, which is completely unique. This is a module that is not offered at any other university. So you're not only looking at law uh, from, a, from a very Eurocentric Western perspective, but you're also actually looking at how law is understood and applied in different parts of the world. And in that context, also looking at how colonialism has had an influence on how we view law and what we consider law. So we ask questions around uh, what, uh, for example, how Islamic law has had an influence through colonialism, what the applicability is in different parts of the world, but can it also actually be considered law? Is religious law as something that we can look or put in par with Western ideas of, let's say, um, 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 uh, West, Western's ideas of law, but also in um, in the same way, looking at the comparison in within the African context, looking at a customary law, is it law? Can it be considered law if it's not written law? 
what are the ideas around colonial interference during the colonial period and what has it done to the understanding of how customary law, for example, is applied and what are the considerations when we look at the um, international influence on law and let's say decolonization. So you get a really good uh, view of not only how law interacts with society, because as I think as Fabio mentioned, um, we look at law not only from a perspective of uh, what is legitimate or not, but also how does law actually influence society and how does society influence how laws are created or even abide by. Even in this context where we say the pandemic and institutions and the credibilities behind institutions are very much also linked with this idea of law and also linked with the idea of politics. So they're all interconnected and within so as you get a chance to interact with those uh, with those modules, not even just within the context of let's say legal systems of Asia and Africa or any other South Asian modules that we have, but also let's say when we look at EU law. What is the implication of legislation that is um, presented or created in the EU that has an influence in Africa or in Asia? So what are the implications behind that? And that is a unique thing that you wouldn't get at any other institution except SOAS. So it's an it's a amazing opportunity if you study law at SOAS. Thank you. Thanks, Lucia. Over to you, Fabio. Thank you, Hannah. I mean, it's, it sounds all very exciting. I would, I would love to study with all of you. Um, it's, it's also, it's a very uh, interesting and exciting moment to study anthropology at SOAS because we've just introduced, we're introducing this coming year, a new curriculum that came out of sort of four years of very intense discussions within the department about what is the canon of anthropology? Is it, you know, do we have to start with Evans Pritchard still? Um, who is relevant and who isn't relevant, and maybe to, as Mira has said, to flip things around a bit. Um, our department has a very high concentration um, on experts. We, we cover uh, East Africa, West Africa, um, Japan, China, the Middle East and South Asia in our ethnography courses. So we have a strong regional expertise, but at the same time, we're trying in this sort of reformulation of the discipline, we're trying to think of the regions in a flipped way, we try to think about global issues from regional perspectives, rather than to think, oh, there's the default Western position, and then there's the different regions that have different ways of doing things. So try to use the regional as a lens, as a focus, and then to see how this um, compares. And so we've introduced, we're introducing this year, a, a range of new courses um, uh, that are sort of less it focused on the history of anthropology, but really what does it mean to study at university? This course called Minded University is specific for first year students to really think, to make them reflect about what do you want out of this degree? What, what is your goal when you come to study at university? We've also um, introduced a series of more practice-based courses like um, how to change things. Um, which is all about cooperation between NGOs, between uh, parliamentary groups, uh, and to think about how can you uh, influence uh, the corridors um, of power as a social scientist. Um, at the same time, we also notice that many students really want to study something very specific that we may not offer as a curriculum. So we've also introduced a new individual module uh, that's called elective reading uh, that you do with just one supervisor individually and you come up with your own syllabus. Um, so to give students really the opportunity to follow their particular interests, to follow the interests that they may have developed over the first uh, one or two years of studying with us. So yes, it's a very exciting time to come to SOAS uh, and to study here. Thank you. Thanks, Fabio. Um, Okay, I think what, what's important to, to be aware of is that this is also something that we know that employers um, tell us they really appreciate in our students. The global perspective, the critical, uh, the ability to kind of think critically about things. So I think across from all the panelists, there's a reflection of that in what we do here at SOAS. Um, and, and we all know that that's something that employers tell us again and again, they appreciate in our graduates. So on that note, we thought it might be useful to hear what many of our graduates go on to do. Um, so I think it might be a chance for um, panelists to also reflect on 
what they might have changed. So I, I was good to hear from Fabio around, you know, what's what's changed in terms of the teaching delivery, the assessment. We I know we all work closely with our students around what we want to do differently in our degree programmes. Um, so feel free to maybe bring that in as we've got a little bit of time as well and uh, give us a sense of what your students go on to do. Where do they work? Um, UK, internationally, what sorts of institutions? Um, let's start with UNSUK and finance and management, please. Sorry. Okay, so as Hannah said, also as Michael emphasized, any, any department in social science as so as uh, we, our students graduate as a so-called Soasian. Okay, we have a very warm heart. We graduated, whatever you studied. So this very unique point is highly recognized and related to our management and financial study by our employer. So believe it or not, our most of our SOAS graduate, they're currently working at, like for example, in, in financial sector in city or major big consulting firms such as KPMG, Deloitte, uh, Deloitte or Ernst Young, such as that company. And then some of the students, they're running their own business. Some students, they're doing their PhD undergraduate, uh, like uh, other, other master degree. So, so uh, the various types of the organization, our graduate working on it, but especially we particularly working on like human resource management side, marketing side, and finance and accounting. And then once they build up their career, eventually many uh, students uh, work in the senior position for organizing entire strategy and development strategy within the organization. If you want to see the details of our students profile, one good example is in Google type my name and then link with my LinkedIn and most of my LinkedIn uh, connections are our graduate. You can see their job where they're working. So you can find I'm not lying now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And I think that's probably reflected across the board that many of us keep in touch with our students after they leave us. So us isn't a huge institution. Um, so I'm sure that's the case for many of us. And that's one of the lovely things, the kind of intimacy around the community that we create. Um, let me go to Mike Jennings next. Thanks. Um, I, I think what's interesting about development studies is that we don't have a single or a, a narrow range of pathways that our graduates go on to do. I think the way students see our programs and the way we see our programs is that we know our students want to make a difference in the world, but they want to find the place where they know they can make that best good difference and our pro our programs and actually the wider support within SOAS it's worth bearing in mind we have a really good careers service um, who, who understand the SOAS students and what they want to do so our task is to help you find that place where you can make a difference so our students end up in all kinds of different really interesting places doing really amazing things and it's also worth bearing in mind that a whole range of employers really like so as students generally, but development studies students, given that that's who I'm here representing, because they have a, a deep, in this case, social science training, and they know the right questions to ask. They don't come in and just with their training, carry on doing things as they've always been done for the past decade or more. They know when things are working and how to see whether things are working and to make differences, to make changes that can improve things. They know the questions to ask, they know how to get the, the data they need to provide the answers and then what needs to be done. So they're incredibly critically engaged and analytical and employers love that. And that means that you can find development studies graduates in a whole range of places. Of course, many do go on to work in the global development or related sector. So they go and work for NGOs like Oxfam, Action Aid, Save the Children. Uh, we have students who've gone on to work for human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. We have students who go on to work for the big donors like uh, DFID as was now FCDO, um, uh, JICA in Japan, um, ADF in France, and so on. We also have, uh, in fact, one of our former students is now the executive director at Care International, one of the major um, uh, international NGOs. We have students who go on to work with refugees, either working directly with refugees or doing research on refugee and migration or working with advocacy and policy organizations. And others have moved, I suppose, out of or aren't necessarily engaged directly in global development, but are working in uh, civil services, are working as journalists. Some have actually gone on to work in kind of 
private banking and, and finance sectors and so on. So it's a huge range. And, and many go on to actually do further studies as well, uh, masters, and then uh, also quite a high proportion go on eventually to do a PhD. So it's a huge range. And I think it's about the skills that you gain from Global, uh, global development studies can, of course, be used and are relevant to a career within that sector, but actually the skills are applicable across a whole range of sectors and types of employment. And it's those skills that are really important. And it's those skills that mean our graduates end up in such amazing and interesting places. I'm quite envious, actually, of the things that they go on to do. Thanks, Mike. And I think that's particularly important in the current moment where things are so uncertain um, to have that range of skills is, is so crucial. Um, let's go to Fabio next in anthropology. Thank you. I can only concur with what, what Mike has just said. I mean, it is really uh, a broad range of different things that people go to do. Uh, on the website for anthropology, it actually says um, on top, uh, says working for the New York Times. That was one uh, student who became a journalist who eventually uh, worked as a well or was commissioned by the New York Times to to write uh, several pieces and uh, dance therapist which was the sort of the other end of the spectrum but again uh, I don't want to give the impression that this is a skill that you directly learn here at SOAS although we do our fair share of dancing as well um, it's uh, many anthropology graduates uh, go to work for NGOs, go into journalism, into education um, all over the world, uh, work for civil uh, service organ or civil society organizations. Um, and it's really about the skills, as Mike has said, and it's really the skill is to ask the right question. Um, and that often, you know, is something that uh, retrospectively seems to very in a very obvious thing. Um, but really, if you're doing your own research, you realize that it's that is the core critical skill to have an awareness of what is at stake, not just out of your personal, you know, or in what is in your personal interest, but really to work uh, to better an organization as you work for it. I think this is something that uh, Suasians uh, are deeply committed to. Thank you. Thanks, Fabio. Um, lovely. Let's hand over to Mira. Thank you. My answer will be short because it's very similar to uh, Mike and Fabio um, uh, in terms of what politics graduates go on to do. You get a similar range of skills, you get a similar range of career pathways, particularly in um, the world of development, journalism, politics. A number of our graduates have gone on to work uh, in the civil service. Um, and actually, we had a very interesting internship scheme recently where um, DEFRA came to us and they said, actually, we'd like some SOAS politics students to come and do internships with us because we're not a very diverse department and you, you seem to have that stuff nailed. So, um, so they went along and that was a very interesting encounter, I think, for both um, parties. So we do um, have students who graduate who are real kind of change makers who see things differently and, and who are able to kind of convey that in their different um, fields. In terms of the skills that we build through the program, um, we have um, research methods training in both qualitative and quantitative um, uh, aspects available and that's good for going into even careers that require um, research but don't seem like research heavy skills so risk analysis and uh, consultancy and other kinds of things uh, like that. Um, we are building in more and more assessments that allow you for example to write a policy brief or a, um, a um, webzine or something like that in order to uh, convey information in a different variety of formats alongside you know the traditional essays presentations and so on. Um, so what we hope that a SOAS graduate will come out with, a politics and international relations or politics, philosophy and economics graduate will come out with, is a very good understanding of how power operates and how um, institutions operate and how these things circulate in the world, but also a really good set of skills and awarenesses about how one can make change, how one can apply this knowledge um, in the service of um, of the thing that one wants to see in the world. And I think that's come through very, um, very well. I think it's also worth saying that um, internationally, SOAS's reputation is really good. It's actually weirdly stronger internationally than it is in the UK. In the UK, it seems to be a relatively uh, smaller institution, but in, within particular circles, within uh, global development, within politics and the policy world, SOAS is very highly uh, regarded. And I think that helps a lot. 
Lovely, thank you. And I am keeping an eye on the questions. I know there've been a couple around uh, open options. Something's just come in around study abroad opportunities. So we'll come back to those, um, but I'll hand over to Lucia and then we'll come to Teresa at the end. Thank you. Um, again, also, I don't have much to add because most of my colleagues have already highlighted this. As someone who does an under undergraduate module of law at SOAS, you would have the opportunity to work at many different organizations from the United Nations to Parliament to working with um, maybe one of our alumni who are also very much still connected with SOAS. We have David Lamy, of course, one of our most famous alumni. So there are many ways that you can get into working with a law degree, not necessarily just an LPC, not necessarily just becoming a solicitor. There are many different things that you can do with a law degree. And we see students that have gone on to different parts of the world as well. So students don't necessarily stay in the UK or in Europe. They go on to actual practicing what they have studied in Asia or in Africa. And wanting to bring that knowledge back, we also see a lot of students continuing on to do a master's degree, for example. So it's because we have specialized programs that look at, for example, law and gender, which is one of the programs that I'm responsible for, but also doing a PhD. So examining and looking, interrogating how law is applicable in many different ways and how we challenge the law and our understanding of the law. And I think the beautiful thing about studying law um, and not necessarily becoming a solicitor, becoming a lawyer also means that you get to taste a little bit of everything. You get to taste of what it means to write, let's say, a policy brief or what it means to be a journalist, uh, what it means to do research for an NGO. We got students who went on to work for Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Greenpeace, etc. So there's a variety of things that you can do with a law degree. And as someone that has studied at SOAS as well, I'm a lecturer at SOAS now, but I started my SOAS uh, experience as a student. And it's always been an experience of evolving, wanting to do more within the institution, but also always being able to learn more about the rest of the world. So that's one of the benefits of actually studying at SOAS as well, and where you end up going with that degree. Thanks, Lucia. Teresa, last but not least. Thanks, uh, Hannah. So we in economics, we have a quite diverse background, not only in terms of social economic diversity, but also in terms of uh, nationality. So we do have different students that, uh, as other colleagues said, uh, they have different interests as well. So sometimes uh, our students might end up working uh, in finance. So we do have some students that have that are working now on HSBC or at Lloyd's or Citigroup. We also have other students that end up working in international organizations, for example, the World Bank, the United Nations or uh, OACD. Those are usually abroad. So we also have a lot of students who end up going to Washington DC, New York, or Paris as well to, to work after they graduate. Um, we do have some uh, students that work obviously here in the UK as well, especially uh, in government, but also in other um, kinds of uh, private institutions. Uh, so we have students, for example, um, Sorry, I, I wrote it down here somewhere, I forgot. So they work in the Department for International Trade uh, here in the UK. Uh, so this is one of what, uh, where in, uh, in the government they could uh, end up working as a SOAS uh, graduate in economics. We also have some others that just go to work for governments in other countries. So we also have students that go, for example, to work in South Africa. And I wanted to highlight that more than 90% of our students, uh, our undergrad students, after they finish uh, their degree, they are already either doing further study, so they might be doing uh, a master's degree either at SOAS or other university or even abroad, or they are already in full-time employment, so they are already working full-time. And I think that uh, what's interesting as well is that SOAS has a very strong network uh, with alumni as other colleagues also put, uh, put forward. And we have something that's called SOAS Connect, which is kind of like an old school Facebook where you can connect with students. It's kind of like a SOAS LinkedIn where you can see where people are working, what they are doing now, you can connect to them, you can ask for tips on how to get a job there. 
And uh, as other colleagues also said, um, this is very, I think being a SOAS graduate in economics uh, also shows that you've learned, you know, different theories, you have critical thinking to kind of understand uh, how theories work in different contexts and why they differ from UK, Europe and the rest of the world. And we also provide this hard uh, technical skills as well. So students also end up learning software to do statistical analysis. So some of them, for instance, go to work as data analysts for Bloomberg and other groups uh, in finance or in uh, in banking, for instance. So yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. I think we've heard from everyone on all three questions, unless I'm mistaken. Um, very briefly. <laughs> yes. Yes. Just I wanted to highlight something that Teresa mentioned around Sales Connect because, um, and I think uh, it was Michael who mentioned it as well. We have a really good program with the Sales Career Service, which is the BAME mentoring scheme that puts students in touch with BAME uh, alumni who are uh, based in different parts of the world to get specific mentorship in the area of research or in the area of field that you want to work in after graduating. So not only do we have Sales Connect, we have actual programs in place to put you in touch with alumni who have already gone into working in the fields that you may be interested in. So that's also one unique thing that Sales has to offer. I also forgot to mention something that we are now in the Department of Economics also launching an internship program. So um, we're also uh, going to put students in touch already when they are doing their degree uh, in touch with other firms. Like obviously they will be in London because it will be in <laughs> during the term. But that means that uh, you can also get some work experience before you leave university as well, which is also quite important before you actually start looking for full time jobs after you graduate. Thanks, Teresa. OK. So we have a couple of questions that I think maybe we can all go around and, and speak to. Uh, one was around open options, which I think Michael has already answered in, in the chat to say that there are opportunities for various open options throughout your degrees with any department, but it does depend on the particular degree. So I know someone was asking about doing the PPE degree that Mira's mentioned a couple of times, where it is a bit more tricky to take open options because you've got to cover the three disciplines within those three years. So it does depend on the particular degree you're doing. And then there was one around um, uh, study abroad options. And I know that per perhaps if you've attended one of the other talks on languages, then with the language degrees, there's a much more integrated program around studying abroad. It's a bit more ad hoc. So if you have anything like that, then do raise it. I'll just briefly mention that I know for economics we have an opportunity to study in Singapore through a summer school that you can attend between the second and final year of your degree and that counts as part of your overall degree so it's a, a condensed uh, module that you take and it counts towards but others might have things to add on that while I catch up on the questions um, does anyone want to add anything on study abroad options or perhaps additional modules they want to mention that are very exciting I'll just quickly jump in there. Um, so we don't have a study abroad um, module as such, but one of the things that students can take in their final year is what we call an independent study project, which every other university would call a dissertation. It's one of the things that makes us unique. Um, and as part of that, many students in the past have used either summer or Christmas vacations to go and get data from abroad uh, and, and, and study abroad. Obviously, for the past a uh, couple of years that hasn't been possible, um, but that normally is is uh, an opportunity for people to go and do that. Um, but as with all departments, you know, we, we're constantly looking at how we can bring in more actual formal study abroad um, options as part of degree programmes. Thank you. Can I just answer to Joseph um, mentioned, you ask if it's, if it's just East Asia, you study abroad and within law. Well, no, you can get different options to where you end up with uh, the study abroad, depending on the program that you choose. So depending on the uh, LOB program that you choose, you get different options to study abroad. So not just East Asia, you do get opportunities to make a selection. And of course, we have to see if it fits within the um, chosen program, but there are many different options in that. Thank you, Lucia. Um, I know there was a question about wanting to do combined degrees um, and are they split 50-50 for combined degrees? So 
I, I guess they tend to be, and as um, Mira has said, you can kind of decide in your very final year where you want the weighting to lie more so that you end up with the first discipline in your degree title being the one in which you've taken more modules in than the second. I think in terms of three-way degrees, such as the PPE degree, the politics, philosophy and economics, they're usually um, sort of specifically designed programmes that already exist. So you wouldn't be able to take, I can't remember what it was, it Korean with international relations and social anthropology, that probably wouldn't be an option that would work unless that degree specifically exists, which I don't think it does. Um, but in terms of the weighting, you can choose and you usually do still have the chance to do a little bit of an open option, perhaps one module per year that you can take in another department. But I can see that Fabio probably is going to correct me. So I'm gonna to go to you, Fabio. Uh, not at all. Um, I just wanted to say, because the, uh, we get a lot of these questions, when you do a joint degrees, um, as Mira said, then you have you have to do the core modules, which reduces your choice overall. And so we we sometimes have a student in their second year who say, well, actually, I don't have the freedom to choose anything at all. So sometimes it makes more sense to do a single honors, which still means you can take courses in other departments as open options. So it's, it's very important to talk to um, your admissions tutor um you know to to get a good sense of of what the right thing for you to do is i think that's very wise and you'll be given an academic advisor as well when you arrive at soas and that's someone that holds on to your whole academic journey and you'll be having regular conversations with them around what decisions you're making for your module choices etc there was a question around how we're coping with covid so i don't know whether yeah. someone wants to take just, that can i just uh, say something on joint degrees i think also uh, something that uh, is quite interested about so is that you can also take a second like a language a second language as part of your degree and uh and so as as far as i'm concerned we have a lot of languages that are not available at other universities such as um, those from uh, African and, and, and Asian countries. So often you will see European languages available. So you can learn French, German, Spanish, and so on. But as always, well you can also learn uh, some other uh, different languages. So I, for instance, I take Swahili in the evenings, um, but you can also do this as part of your degree. You can learn Yoruba, you can learn Swahili, you can learn many other things. So I think this is also something that SOAS can bring uh, different Thanks, Teresa. So uh, whilst people are maybe wanting to think about COVID and the impact on us, because we've got a couple of minutes left, I also thought it might be worth all of us putting in uh, the name or sorry, the email address of our uh, undergrad programme convener in case people have follow up questions. Um, if it's you, then put your email and maybe just next to it, write what subject it's for, um, just in case people want to follow up and maybe don't want to raise their hand right now or ask a question in the chat. I think that would be useful. I'll put Angelos's in, Teresa, don't worry. Um, does anyone want to tackle COVID in terms of how we're managing, Mira? Um, my light just fell off my computer, so that's how I'm coping with COVID right now. Um, so COVID, I mean, we've really tried, I would say, to maximise access for everybody. Um, students have a really wide range of needs. Obviously, some are really keen to get back on campus and we've tried to put as much as we can on campus. Others are actually much um, better off studying remotely because of medical reasons or because their uh, travel situation is difficult or because of family reasons. Um, and we've tried as much as we can to offer both online and uh, in-person options um, where that's a possibility. We've recorded a lot of the stuff so that if you have missed it in one or other format, you can um, catch up with it. Um, so us is quite a small campus and a number of our rooms are quite small. So that's something that we have to um, negotiate. I mean, that's great because we do a lot of small group um, teaching, um, but for pandemic uh, city center reasons, that's not um, amazing. So we'll continue. I mean, everybody has learned a lot of new skills about online uh, platforms and teaching um, over the last year or so. And I'm sure we'll continue to evolve this uh, as the situation continues to unfold. finally getting there with muting and unmuting. Thanks, Mira. I think that does sum it up quite nicely um, across the board. Does anyone have any final words they want to add? I, or if I've missed a question, tell me that I've missed a question and someone can take it. 
No, any, any... Can I just, maybe I'll just encourage everyone, look, whatever programme you're planning on studying, please do go and have a look at the website. Please have a look at the structure to see exactly what modules you'd be taking and what's available to you. And if you have any questions, get in touch with, I mean, obviously we've put names of people you can get in touch with. Uh, really, you can get in touch with anyone at SARS. We'll, we'll, they'll send you to the right place as well. And if you want to speak to a student um, to get their experience, we can, of course, arrange that uh, through the admissions department. Um, so if you, it's a really important decision. You have to pick the place that's right for you. We hope, obviously, SOAS is that place for you. Um, but do ask as many questions as you want. And remember, there is no question that no one else wants to know the answer to. No, there's no such thing as a silly question. It doesn't, you know, any question you want to ask, someone else will also want to know the answer to it as well. So please do get in touch. But, you know, good luck with whatever decision you take and wherever you end up. Absolutely. Thank you, Mike. Um, for that, and that really uh, summarises things quite nicely. And I think the last thing to say is we're sorry that we're not seeing you in person, and we hope that you do find the opportunity to come onto campus uh, soon. And um, there's nothing quite like the SOAS campus, so um, please do come and visit us when the chance arises. And we hope to see you in COVID free times uh, in September. Um, and do follow up over email if you have anything else. But I think that just leaves me to thank everyone. Thank you to the panellists for making a Saturday available. And thank you to all of you for coming on a Saturday and wish you a nice weekend. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks, bye. bye.